Hey everyone, welcome back to yet another uh, wonderful and fantastic, informative and wildly entertaining interview here on the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. Uh, just remember, guys, if you want to listen to all my interviews or any of my other interviews or our music podcast, please go to Ludini Rock and Roll Circus dot. It's a brand new website where you can get all your Ludini needs met right there on the internet. Today, I am speaking with Robert Johnson and Pam yes. Taylor of Stolen Hearts. I uh, had you guys go in there for a second. Uh, no, we're not. Uh, we're not channeling today. Uh, although we might, we might. But uh, this is a great Let's band. They've got, a, they've got a new record coming out or out called uh, Dirty Southern Soul. It's a great. Uh, sort of free-flowing mix of all kinds of roots music from blues and rock and country. There's a little bit of uh, jazz uh, uh, sprinkled in there. Welcome, guys. I've got I got them both on the line, Pam and Robert. Welcome, guys. How are you today? Hey, we're doing great. Yeah, How about you? Awesome. It's a lazy okay. Sunday, enjoying the rain. <laughs> oh, so it's rest of work. So where are you guys based out of? We're about 30 miles south of Charlotte, North Carolina, and my hometown is in Lancaster, South Carolina, is where we live. But mostly, our, we play music around the Charlotte area, the biggest musical town near us. Robert's from Charlotte, so I had moved him out in the country. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the scene like down there? Are you got you guys able to work a lot? Yeah, we stay busy. Like we we can we can usually. What we usually do is we travel out of town at least one night a weekend, and then we play in within an hour or an hour and a half radius of where we live another night. So, And just about every weekend we're playing somewhere because that's just what we like to do. We couldn't imagine, you know, just sitting at home. We call it normaling. We had, some, well, we had, some, we had a night off Friday night, and we had, went out into an art gallery and listened to some live music and had dinner with some friends and then come back and roasted marshmallows and s'mores. And that's, and, and it's very rare that we get to do that because we're so busy, you know, on the weekends when all of our other friends are out either coming to our shows or going to do their leisurely activities. But, but that's what we do. We, we call it normally. <laughs> <laughs> that's the life of a musician. Everybody's, yeah, chilling, is. everybody's chilling out on the weekends and that's when we get busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so how did, um, how did how did Stolen Hearts come together? Well, it had to be the demise of a couple of other things. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, Pam hey, Rob, band. Robert, Robert, you're feel free to jump in any time. Don't let her do all the talking. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, I'll jump in. I'll <laughs> yeah, he's the quiet one. He always says, "Now, when I do talk, you know that I felt strongly enough to butt in. But if I don't, it's all good. You got it, baby." I've got a really good handle on it. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. When we met, we both had existing bands, and we were pretty successful. Uh, my, my CD, Hot Mess, had been released. Uh, we met on the night of, we actually had our first date on the night of my CD release party. And um, and his his band, Moses Jones, you know, they were really busy all the time, too. And then um, a couple of uh, things happened, and, and my band broke up. And then within a, a month or two, his band broke up. And, and uh, we were just kind of sitting around you know, trying to figure out what to do. I tried to put another band back together, and it just wasn't right. It was almost like family and then trying to replace it with non-family members afterwards. It just didn't feel the same, and so mm -hmm. it just didn't work out. But well, yeah, and that and the fact that we had just gotten to the point where we couldn't get people to practice. We couldn't, you know, we were bringing new music to them, and it was just not, yeah. it was not being received well by my band with me and by, you know, Pam with the Pam Taylor band. We just kind of looked at each other one night and said, you know what? At the end of the day, I can count on you to do your best with my music. And the same goes for me, you know, to serve the music. Because that's what it's really all about, is serving the music. And then that's, that's when it really got started. Yeah, because neither one of us are just lining up to collect a paycheck at the end of the day. Like, you know, when you hire musicians to play in your band, that's, you know, a lot of times you can get that. And, and then sometimes there's that special connection you have, you know, and uh, like me and Robert, where you just know it's not about that, so you never really have that issue of like, well, I don't want to do this because of that, or it, it, it's, well, let's go do this, because me and Robert, we we have fun as long as we're together. You know, play. Fun, we could have fun in a paper bag. <laughs> we don't need much other, other than you know, ourselves <laughs> and some good music, and, 
you know, we just we just try to have fun no matter what we do. And it, it, the other bands had gotten to where it wasn't that fun anymore either. And that was the one more promise I made to myself when when pursuing a music career. Like, I'm going to do it until it's not fun anymore. You know, and then when it's not fun, I'm not going to do it or I'm going to change the way I do it to where it is fun. That's got to be first and foremost because I've, uh, for the last 15 years, I've sold cars and that's not really fun. And I'm tired of doing things that aren't fun. You know, it's like I don't want to, you know, have one foot in one world and one foot in the other. And, uh, you know, it's just once once we kind of went head first and put everything into it, and then this is, this is, this is what we got. This is what we got, yeah. But it's, uh, I'm having a lot of fun. You know, even on the days that it's not so perfect, I still look over and he's right there, you know. And it, it just makes it, it, it's re- it makes it really special to be able to do what we do with, with each other. And, you know. I should be on a higher pay scale. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, talk about the money again. I'm going to find me somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so how, um, how important then, like now that you, you guys work in, you work as a three-piece, you bring in a, you guys, you guys have a drummer, is that how you, is that how you generally perform or do you have a, a keyboard player as well? Typically. Well, ultimately, Stolen Hearts is me and Robert, and then Just we do a lot of duo stuff. Okay. And then when the when it calls for something a little more higher energy or whatever, you know, really not any no, less no, energy, just but something just yeah. something different. Yeah. And then we bring our drummer in, and then uh, my dad plays saxophone, and we he, he comes in and sits with us sometimes. He was in okay. the band, Taylor Band. Um, and when we had our CD release party, we had seven people with us. I mean, including us. It was seven in total. We called it the Super Seven. We had keyboards. We had conga player. We had a backup singer. My dad on the horn, and me and Robert, and then our drummer. Kind of had a mishmash of uh, Pam Taylor band and my band, but just yeah, it was. It was and then I had to, you know, sprinkle on some uh, some other you know, awesomeness. It give our it give our fans in the area a unique experience when they hadn't heard like because they've either, either either only heard us as the duo or with my dad and Rome on the drums. Not as like a full blown band with backup singers and everything mm-hmm. like that. So it was, it was just something we wanted to make the CD release party because we live in the Charlotte area. We play there all the time. So any day of the week or any you know night on the weekend, of somebody from Charlotte can come and hear us as a duo or hear us as a trio. But that was something that nobody oh, ever did. And we ended up selling out the venue. So I guess we made a right choice to you know give them something. You know, unique that they would, you know, make it special. The, the fact that we were releasing our debut album was special enough, but, you know, just give them. Because the way the record was produced is we used outside musicians over the course of right. like three years it took to make that CD. It was in the making before we even knew it. <laughs> you know, so we wanted to kind of give that same kind of feel that's on the CD at the show. So. Okay, let me ask you guys about a little bit more about the CD then, since you brought it up. The CD was in three years in the making. Now, um, were these songs that you guys had separately and then you brought together, or did you write them together? How did, how did, it, how did it work? I know there's a breakdown on your uh, on your one sheet here, but I'd like you guys to talk a little bit about well, uh, well, how that happened. Yeah, it's actually it's more of it's a yes to everything you just asked. <laughs> so, yes, was it songs that we had before? Yes. Was it songs that we wrote together? Yes. yes. And then it was stuff, stuff that we brought from other things. So, yes. Yes, all three. Well, the dream, which is track number one, I recorded. It was the last song Pam Taylor Band recorded before we dismantled, and so we didn't finish the CD. I had an Indiegogo campaign going on, and that was a song we kind of did as a single to release to promote the the making of the new CD. And so it, I just had it, you know, and it was just sitting there. And and Robert had uh, recorded some songs with the same producer um, when he, right after his band was kind of on the ends. And I think that kind of, uh, they just sat there too. You know, we, he, he released them as singles on iTunes under Robert Johnson Jr., but we really weren't doing anything with them because they, they weren't on a CD that somebody could buy. And, okay. and we, we really weren't performing a lot of them. I was them. just making food bag coffee. <laughs> yeah, we did. We, we got to have our own little CD making factory here. But and then, we, then we had, uh, we pulled one song from Hot Mess just to kind because the, our stories intertwine. Like the night we met was the release of my CD, and and yeah, so we yeah. wanted to bring it in because that was part of our the beginning of our relationship. It's almost like it tells a story of what we kind of did before we met each other, and then it brings what we've done together. Like Come On Baby was written together. My Johnny was uh, inspired by our relationship, um, and then 
already all right with something that uh, was written like right after. So I lost my job about a year and a half ago with selling cars after 15 years I mentioned earlier. And that was that was a song that came from that experience early on, you know, before we weren't even stolen hearts then. I was just sitting at home uh, with a lot of time on my hands writing and, lear- you know, learning more about my instrument. And then we had the live version of My Brother Goes Blind, uh, which is all of stolen hearts plus my dad. Um, and then we had, we brought Bring Your Love. We brought that from the Moses Jones record that we had. Yeah, the band he was in. The band I was in. And then um, the Carolina Days is a song that I, it was like one of the first songs I'd ever written. And then um, what else is it? Well, Ain't No Man is a theme song he wrote, he wrote especially for uh, a television show, yeah. a reality hunting show. And, and we weren't really sure. It's like, you know, it kind of sounds, you know, it, it's us and we do it. You know, we perform it, and um, but it was, I guess before the CD kind of fell together, we we were overthinking it, and we we didn't feel like those songs kind of belonged on the first Stolen Heart CD. So we went actually in the studio and started to record twice. some of this, yeah, twice, two different studios to try to record some of this new stuff, and it was almost like the universe was working against us. And then we sat down and we looked. I was like, baby, we got enough to make a whole CD if we just bring in everything. From the beginning, because we kind of went off to, and an, uh, that's when we recorded Come On Baby, I Got Your Shoes, and My Johnny was recorded, and, and, and a lot of it's not us playing on, like, the the instruments on there. And that was another reason why we were, you know, a little uh, hesitant about putting all those on the new Stolen Heart CD, because it's so many other musicians, and that part of our egos is like, well, this isn't us. Why would we want to present this? But I was like, but, you know, that's what it took to get to us. And we need to let the people hear that this is where we came from. These are the musicians that help us get there. And we're not going to treat them like, you know, uh, the musicians that, uh, session musicians that they used in the past where all these people were making buttloads of money off of the music and it wasn't even them performing it and they didn't let anybody know about it. We we watched that movie Wrecking Crew not too long ago and uh, with Carol Kay and... uh, Great movie. Yeah, I watched it. Yeah, and it, it made us think. I was like, why don't... We just put all of those songs on there, and then we make it about them. You know, we, we, we use the whole inside cover just as special thanks, all, like, 16 different musicians. And what's really that, cool is I'm fixing to start taking bass lessons from Carol. Yeah. Um, so, so I wanted to ask, Robert, um, so you mentioned all these different musicians, and um, you guys typically perform as a duo. Um, Robert, what is your – do you have a primary instrument, or are you just Robert Johnson, multi-instrumentalist? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I started out playing bass when I was 15, you know, in my high school metal band. Well, it was a guitar minus two strings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, it was four, man. Four man's bass. Yeah. So I did that, and then um, at about 21 years old, I stopped playing the bass because it was very lonely, you know, just being there all by yourself <laughs> playing the bass. You know, people, yeah. people would come over, and they'd say, hey, man, play um, – play, I don't know, Sweet Home Alabama, and I'd play it. And then they say, play this, and then the, that sounds exactly the same. I like, Sweet Home you know, Alabama. Like, yeah, they're like, man, you're really good. I'm like, this is fucking <laughs> Yeah, this is their song. Grab so, a guitar. Yeah, so I grabbed a guitar and started playing acoustic guitar. I never really played the bass again. And just every now and then, you know, somebody's gig, you know, they would let me up, and I would, you know, just do some bass lines that I remembered, you know, because, what we do is what I was trying to explain to Pam. She she never really played in a metal band or a punk band, how different bass lines are for that type of music. Versus what the blues line. Yeah, versus what, the way we play bass, you know, now in, in the soul and blues style of playing the bass. So then um, I got a mandolin. I found a mandolin. I'm a... I'm a pawn shop junkie. I'm a, <laughs> I spend more. I spend more money on on guitars that um, you know should probably be. You know, if they were Track. a horse, if they were a horse, they'd be put down. He know? sees the beauty and potential in, in them. <laughs> yeah, man, and I and I and I spend I spend money to, to make them. You know, the worth way, the not even worth. Right. They'll work less than what he paid to get them in playing conditions. <laughs> now we have them hanging all over our walls in our house. Yeah. So, <laughs> So then I, I bought a, uh, it's like a 59, man, it's a mandolin, straddling mandolin from 50, okay. 50, 59. And I just started messing with it years and years ago, and it just kind of sat over in the corner. And then finally, um, 
Pam had wrote my Johnny. I don't even know why we decided to do Man Moon because I, I hadn't really ever. He had to learn the chords to play along with it. Yeah, he never really messed with it. I never really knew he knew the chords, which is kind of the way I play anyway. I don't really know where he knew that stuff. He just kind of picks it up and plays it. And um, so, and then that's how that came about. And what's so funny is people are asking me to come and play mandolin on their records, and I'm like, well, I know three chords. I'm like, (laughs) I I totally will. Let me get my chord book out. But yeah, so I, for a long time. I considered myself just a guitar player, but then when Stolen Heart started up, I, bass is what we needed, you know? And, yeah. and yeah. I found out how much I really missed coming up with the groove, you know, that kind mm-hmm. of groove, man. And, and that, that kind of was like, wow. So I guess to answer your question the long way around it, sorry about that, but um, it's, I just see myself as a musician. I mean, whatever it is, if it be the triangle or the, you know, the tambourine, <laughs> the or, the tambourine. Kazoo, or the kazoo. I mean, yeah, I play the foot tambourine as well. It's about what the song needs. It's, it's not about exactly. let's focus on the becoming time. the greatest yeah. mandolin player. It's like, what is, what, what, what how would this song benefit? Right. Yeah, from what instrument needs to be on here to tell the story we want to tell. And, and, and Robert has a beautiful way of picking up anything and, and being able to, put it into the song the way it needs to be done and without being a master on it, you know. And now now there's he's playing harmonica along with while he's singing and play, playing guitar and and have foot percussion going on. He's so busy up there. Yeah, his pay scale does need to go up because he takes the yeah, whoa, 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 like hold five on, hold on, hold on, somebody write that down. <laughs> so, so, in other words, so in other words, Robert, you're kind of like Getty Lee back there. Is that what you're saying? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Be the roots, the roots rock version technical. of Getty Lee. <laughs> Dude, uh, I'm a poor man's Getty Lee. <laughs> yeah. So, so let me ask you because you have songs um, that are yours that are on the uh, record, um, and I just um, boy, there's one I really by the way, Carolina Days, and I want to ask you about that, but. Um, like, how do you, do you write on the bass, or do you write on the guitar, or how do you approach songwriting then? Well, my I wrote it on acoustic guitar, which I have wrote every song on this one acoustic that I have. It's my bass. Mm-hmm. I've had it for 25 years now. But my acoustic playing, because I did the Lonely Boy in the Corner Act for so long, you know, that I had okay. to find a way to play, to play the bass lines around my rhythm lines. So technically, I was writing the bass line and the guitar line at the same time, naturally, without even realizing I was doing it. So most most of the time, when you hear me just playing the acoustic, you'll hear the bass lines in the background that that we you know we use for the songs themselves as well. Pam, um, how did uh, talk a little bit about your influences and how you got started? You're primarily a guitarist and vocalist, right? You don't yes. you don't go jump in on keyboards or anything. Um, talk a little bit about well, your guitar. Well, I took piano for seven years. Uh, yeah, so, I, so did I. But I, you know what? I you put me in front of a piano. I can play with one hand. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, it's, it's, I've never. I, I, it, I was in second grade and I played by ear. The first song I ever played was Amazing Grace, and it was at the church one Sunday after they had played the song in church. And I climbed up on there and played it. And my mama was like, "Oh my God, gotta put her in." Me. Less than so far. Prodigy. Yeah, and then it's sucked all the fun out of it. And, and I, I, I love piano as an instrument. I love to hear it. I wish I could play it like I can guitar, but I have no desire whatsoever to sit down and play it. And uh, on, I guess because of the way I was taught to play it, it was very theoretical and uh, almost... Um, learning classical stuff, recital kind of pieces, it, just, it was boring. And yeah. I didn't care to learn theory. I just wanted somebody to show me how to get on there and jam. Show me the patterns. Like on a guitar, I taught myself how to play uh, guitar. And I took my first guitar lessons uh, last year. And uh, I took with Debbie Davies. And she kind of... Oh, she yeah, me Debbie Davies. That's, yeah, well known. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and she taught. She just put it all together for me in a way that I could understand. She was like, show me how you want to be taught. So, Because I told her the story about the piano and that I never... Uh, really cared about learning relearning how to play it and I might go and sit you know 
if I had the opportunity with a keyboard to sit down like I do guitar every day um, and try to do it myself, it might would be different. But it just kind of, uh, the, the guitar was just so different for me. I got my first one at 18, acoustic guitar from my grandpa. And um, I, I immediately started writing songs. I'm a songwriter. And, and learning how to play guitar is a byproduct of me wanting to write songs. My dad kept putting, well, you, you just can't write songs without having an instrument. It helps you learn every chord you can, and then your songs can grow. The, the potential for, you know, you know, it just opens wide up. You know, you don't need anybody to come and say, hey, well, let's run this line to see how this melody goes. You can do it all yourself. And that's really where the need for that came. And then when my band broke up, I decided that I didn't want a big band anymore. And so I... I really was hiding behind the mask of the full sound of the band because I was just a really lousy strummer, to be honest, <laughs> and, and until until I lost my job and had the time to sit really and, and try to master the instrument. And I'm nowhere near mastering it. I am in a process of trying to feel, you know. There is no try. There is no try. Well, I would do or do not. See, I, uh, Pam, I wouldn't know that. You actually... Um, I'm a guitar player, too, and I thought you were, like, a pretty good lead guitar player. It doesn't sound, I don't hear anything where, you know, I mean, there's nothing that makes it, that you, where you come across as just learning at all. <laughs> you sound really good. Yeah, can there's I, a long way around people to way when I tell them I just took my first guitar lessons a year ago, everybody's like, what? Yeah, really, yeah. exactly. So, it, you know, it, it's, I, I appreciate that people are appreciating my guitar licks now, and it's not just about my songwriting or my vocals has always really been the main thing. Um, so it's really cool to talk shop with, with other guitar players now and, and have them want to jam with me or, you know, it, it, and it really makes you rise to the occasion when you on stage with a great guitar player. Like, I, you know, before I took lessons from Debbie, I played with her uh, with just a little bit of knowledge I had from my being self-taught and there's video of that on YouTube and then it's so it's kind of cool to go back and watch now my videos because it's a really huge learning tool for musicians to watch yourself no matter how oh, painful yeah. it is watch yourself and listen to yourself so you can hear like oh man I wish I, I should have held that note a little longer I wish my sustain was better or I wish I would have waited to, to vibrato or you know or uh, you know and it just it's just a great learning tool to see how far you come because I may have an off day, but I still need to recognize my progress. You know, I've come a long way, and I, I'm a perfectionist, and I got, and I've got i been dropping some of that because right, right, me and my dad have the same disease of not wanting to look stupid. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and then Robert, Robert's like, God, you sound just like your dad. He said, well, I don't. I like to be rehearsed. I don't like to, you know, get up there and make mistakes. I want, I want you know, to entertain people as, as well as mesmerize them. And and I don't if I don't feel prepared I don't want to do it you know until it's ready and that's how you know we get the songs prepared here but I, I with my guitar playing I just kind of jumped out there and did it because I I figured out that the best way to learn is out of necessity so I didn't really get nose to the grindstone until it, we were it was just me and Robert and I needed to learn how to play rhythm and lead at the same time um, because it, there's there's nothing to hide behind with a three piece. You know, it, and and it's just um, it made me rise to the occasion, learn my instrument, um, and it's just made us learn dynamics, like his parts versus my parts versus the drum parts in a trio. They have to be perfectly timed to fill all the spaces so that you sound like a, a fi at least a five-piece band on stage when it's just three of you. You know, it's just a trick to be in a power trio, and we've. Uh, Making it that way has really, really made us hone in on our musicianship, um, and it's just been—it's been a lot of fun because a lot of times my vocals are always fighting over the loudness of of another guitar player, or and I, we just don't really have that. You know, if I if I want to turn if I want my vocals to stand up, I just turn down. I play differently. I'm in control, and it's just—I love it. You know. And it's, it's 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 high intense. It's it's really a lot more intense because I can't drop the guitar and just start singing. Or folks, you know, I have to keep it all going. You know? so, so, so how do you? So what is your um? What is your approach to songwriting? Do you write songs every day? Are you, you have lyrics constantly going through your head? Like how do you how do you do, how do you uh, approach songwriting? Well, lyrics are constantly going through my head. Ideas. I, I'm, I'm attaching to things like oh, oh wow, is that. Nobody's ever, I've never heard anybody say that before in a song or, you know, and then there's always just ideas going. 
but the actual songwriting process changes for me. Um, sometimes it's a, a guitar lick. Whenever I was learning with Debbie, it was mainly most of my songs. I wrote like 20 songs in like two months um, because I would learn a new lick, and then I would hear a song around that whole lick. And, and the songs, Debbie would be, I've never taught anybody like you. I, you teach, I teach you a guitar lick, and then the next week you've written a song, and that lick's all in it. She's like, I've just never really experienced that. And I was like, well, that's the first time that's really happened, you know, for me too. And because mm-hmm. um, sometimes it, it is me just sitting down with strumming, you know, and it not be based around a lick because I really couldn't do licks before. So that that was a new outlet of, of songwriting. Sometimes sometimes a song will take a year or more. I have an yeah. idea, you know, for a song and it, it builds and it maybe because there's something else that really – that has to happen in real life to to finish the song. And, and that's happened a lot where I started a song and then something, some major event or just some happenstance thing happened that made the song make sense to me to finish. So, uh, and then yeah, it just comes all, it just yeah. really from, from all, there's no one I way to write a song. Yeah. I think it's you funny. limit yourself. If you try to sit down and write a song, you know, it's like sometimes I, I spit one out in five minutes. You know, and Robert's got different. Go ahead, Rob, why don't you, so Robert, way. go ahead and address the same the same thing. How do you approach the songwriting? Um, basically the same way. I mean, it comes to me in different times. Um, I I feel like I'm um, part songwriter, part family historian. I find myself mm-hmm. doing that. Um, He's a storyteller. Family yeah, storyteller. and I, and all the stories come from you know stories. <clears throat> about my, you know, my grandmother, my, you know, my aunts or something inside my family. And um, I find a need to, to make that, you know, to get that out to the world um, so that I can introduce them to, you know, to the world. Who's, you in Carolina days, you have in parentheses Bootsy song. Who's Bootsy? Uh, Bootsy is my aunt who passed away uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, she died of um, cancer a couple of years ago. And I wrote that song, the, the first verse of that song I actually wrote in 10th grade, sitting in my homeroom class in 10th grade. And um, I've had it forever. And when I really just decided to stop, you know, just playing on my front porch and, and making this, uh, you know, this band thing, uh, you know, happen, uh, I finished that song, Carolina Days, with a friend of mine, um, Bill, Bill Scannell. And we, that was like our song. And then my Aunt Bootsy came over and heard it, and she loved it so much. But where I lived at the time, it was, you know, it was it was just covered up with cover bands, really. That's all it was. You couldn't get a gig um, there with original, music, with original yeah. music. I mean, you could sprinkle it in, but, you know, no wasn't nobody listening. They all wanted to hear, you know, what are, you know, Brick House or um, Give Me Two Steps. Leonard you know, Leonard <laughs> Smith. You know what I mean? Freebird. And my Aunt Bootsy would come to the shows. She would come to the shows and she's like, play that Carolina Day song. Play that Carolina Day song. And uh, so one night uh, I couldn't get my band to play it because they, they only wanted to do covers, man. So I just grabbed one of their guitars from them and just told them to sit down while I did the song. And I, <laughs> And I did it, man. And it was empowering. It was empowering. And I was like, and it wasn't, that might, there might have been another, one more gig after that with them. I quit. I quit to do, for, you know, to do, the, you know, my songs the way I wanted to do them, man. And then um, my Aunt Bootsy found out she had cancer and she didn't, she wasn't around very long after. And um, she, we were, the whole family, we were in, uh, in her bedroom and she was really sick, man. And, uh, she asked me if uh, if I would play that song at her funeral. Aww. And Ooh. it's stuck. Yeah. What a beautiful it's story! Stuff. That's a and, beautiful story, Robert. Yeah, and I did, man. I I got up and it was so awesome because there was like I, I bet there was three hundred people inside that place that day just celebrating her life, man. Because that, that's what she did was healthy. She, she had a big personality. Yeah, an even bigger heart, you know, for people, and uh, it, it was just awesome because I got up there to sing that song. It was it was the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. It was the hardest performance I've ever had to do. You know, with my family sitting there looking at it, 
looking at it, and then I was able to dedicate that song to her. So that's that's why it's called Booty Song. It's when a, I it's decided to great record song. it, I added that to the end of it. Yeah. Well, it was like the pinnacle for him to, to start making original music and to make that a forefront and to not fall in line with everybody else and play cover songs, even though it made it even ten times more difficult to get gigs, ten times more difficult to get a band to play original music. Yeah. But that, and what, that was yeah, our, and what's super cool is the town that I was living in is known for original music, and that's probably, I'm not going to say it was, all your idea? I'm, it was all my idea, but I, I am the, I am probably the. the He's a fire starter. I'm the, I, I, yeah, I made it. I made it happen in with some other characters, and that that town is known. I mean, they even had a thing called Original Songwriters Night. You know, for a town that just plays, you know, um, cover songs. That was pretty. That's been pretty impressive yeah. now, these days. Three years later, you know. Well, the wheels turn slowly on that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and they come in cycles. You know, I've seen that in different towns too, where yeah. you know there was a big, uh, you know, every, nobody wanted to hear originals, and then all of a sudden, you know, it kind of like took off for a while. It kind of comes in waves. Um, Pam, I wanted to talk real quick to you about the song "My Johnny," which um, really uh, t- just like kind of really blew me away. Um, it's a beautiful, very sincere country song. Have you ever thought? Have you guys ever considered that maybe you should like go go harder for that market? Because I mean, I, like Carolina Days, is, it, with the, especially with the backstory of it, and then the song My Johnny. It's, there's a real, there's a lot of sort of like that country thing that sort of like flows through what you guys do. Well, we're not limiting ourselves. That's why we made up the genre, Dirty Southern Soul, because. We're not a blues band. We're not just a country band. We're not Americana. We're not Motown. We're not, you know, we're not, we're all of those things that inspired us. And, mm-hmm. and if a country station, if this is a true story, and it's funny that you ask that because I sent my Johnny, Carolina Days, and all the country sounding songs on that record over to a promoter, and he said, it's too country for country radio. It's too country for country. He said it's too country. <laughs> it needs to be more pop to be played on a country station. I thought I was going to just fall out. Like, <laughs> really? Really? Oh, boy. That... We're more hoping that the roots um, Americana people pick up, you know. Yeah, we've sent it to a couple different places. Of course, our, our promoter, Frank Rosak, who I used hot, uh, when I promoted Hot Mess, he did wonderful things with that record. And, you know, when we when we put it together, it was really just for our fans to sell at shows because everybody's like, God, we'd really like to have my Johnny and Come On Baby, and, you know, and all these songs on, on a CD that we could take home. And we were busy, you know, trying to put other stuff together, and, and this is what they wanted. And and it, it, when we put it together, we, we listened to it, and we just, with tears in our eyes, we looked at each other and said, baby, there's something to this. We don't need to just... Got a good record. Yeah, this is a pretty good record. And so I called up Frank, and I asked him to listen to it. He said, yes. He said, he said I don't really know. Well, let's throw it out there and see where it lands. You know, let's don't just put it in, in Americana or put it in country. Let's just send it everywhere and see who chooses to play what and let the people decide where it needs to be. Um, you know, because it I, it's really hard for me to sing anything and not sound like blues is coming out of me. I don't, you know, and then that, it, my Johnny really show, showcases a different side of my voice that not a lot of people are used to hearing because I'm a belter. And so that really shocked people when I came out with my Johnny. And, um, you know, it's something just so different than what they're used to hearing. And, and there's a lot more of that. When, if you come to a live show, you hear a lot more of that. We just haven't, you know, been able to record it yet. Um, you know, there's some videos out there showing our range and what we what we are a live show is all about. But this is just like the tip of the iceberg. It's volume one. We've already got like two and three already ready. To That's go what I was going to ask you. In the studio. What's next for you guys? What's coming up next as we wrap up here? So what's what's coming up next for you guys? Where are you headed? We're well. We're gonna make more dirty Southern soul. You know, as long as, <laughs> and, and 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 we're just. It, I, I I've written. I've finished two songs this week. Uh, that I had been working on, and um, between Robert and I, when we came together, we have over like a hundred, hundred something songs, original songs. So we're just gonna start chiseling away at those, and 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 getting better at uh, you know whatever instrument we choose to pick up. Right now, I'm interested. I've been playing my guitar on my lap and playing with the slide, and 
you know, and, and um, you know, working on harmonies. And, and our, our biggest challenge has been coming together and write, actually sitting down and writing songs together because we're both individual songwriters and we've never really written with other people before. So that's been a challenge and we want to try to focus more on that. A lot of the songs will be almost done and then he'll contribute uh, a line or two and then the bass line and, and the same with his. He'll have a song that's almost finished and then stuck, you know, and then I'll come in and be able to do this or have an idea. But we, we never really sat down with a concept and finished a whole song front to bottom with with both me, him and I 100% front to bottom because that's how we grow. Is it? <laughs> yeah, and the other thing is we're working um, – we're – we're in the infant stages of starting to work with other artists yeah. in, in our area, young, you know, young people. Uh, we had a guy named Jordan Middleton open for us last Great night. Great songwriter. Great songwriter. Nobody knows about Nobody him. Nobody knows We want to change yeah. that. And we, um, well, we, have, we, we usually try to get, you know, people out that, you know, would never have a chance to be in front of our, you know, our people, you know, and, and it's, it's great. And it's it's encouraging great. them to do original music. Most of them are going to fall into the same trap. A, a, a beautiful girl writes original music, but she sits in a corner and plays uh, Lady Gaga and stuff like that just because that's what she thinks that people want to hear, and they really would benefit from hearing her point of view, which is her original music, and we want to encourage that more and more and more. Um, and, you know, also we like to give back to the community, so we we got some fundraisers that um, – we got coming up that we're planning, and then always I work uh, with Girls Rock, which is a yeah. Um, go ahead and talk about Girls Rock for a little bit, and then give us anything you, you guys, both you and Robert, would like to plug. Um, you know, any internet stuff or whatever. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, but Girls Rock is uh, Girls Rock Charlotte is the affiliate that I'm actually with, um, but it's been going on two years. The founder Kelly Finley. It started because her daughter loved Girls Rock. She had to take her out to Raleigh and Chapel Hill were the two closest ones and it, she just saw some amazing things happen and it's not just about learning guitar skills or learning the bass or learning how to rock out. What these girls come in and learn is confidence and the camaraderie and what it takes to be in a band and not just the music part but you know working and being uh, among other girls your age and getting along with each other and finding your own voice, being empowered and, and not being, you know, for, when I, I didn't have anything like that whenever I was their age, and there was bullying going on, there was just a lot of different things going on in my life that I felt like um, I had experience with that I could help these girls today with, not not only just me and being able to show them a, a guitar chord or help them sing a song or write a song, but uh, these girls come in in the beginning of the week and they, they write an original song, they, they form a band, they learn an instrument, and then by the end of the week, they're performing their song live. And we had over 100 people uh, with, at the in concert this year, and it's just getting bigger and better, and it's just more amazing in the level of talent that's coming in from these girls, and the, it just really changed my life. I, I, whenever they, the, the concept was brought to me and they were asking me for help, I was like, you know, I don't know how that'll work. I know what it takes to write an original song and then get confident enough about it to perform it live. But then at the end of the day, it wasn't even about that anymore. You know, it's the, the girls walking on stage after everything they've done all week and then pouring their hearts and souls out, it, it meant more than what the song sounded like or what, you know, it, 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 it was a beautiful thing. And, and I think anybody that has uh, teenage daughters that have any kind of uh, musical uh, tendencies should get them in their camp in the summers. They're, they're all over the place. You can go to the, the Girls Rock affiliate and you can pick out which town or, you know, in which state and see what's going on. But the Girls Rock Charlotte, the, it's uh, girlsrockclt.com if you're in the Charlotte area or in driving distance. But it's just a, just a really great program. And we do stuff all throughout the year with the girls, little workshops and and there's even a spinoff for the Lady Rock Stars. The, the girls that help instruct, they also are doing like one for women, and they have free wine. <laughs> so it's <laughs> free wine. Really yeah, and who can say no to free wine? And then, you know, it's just like living your fantasy. If you've ever felt like at the end of the week the, the women are up in an all-girl rock band performing songs. So it's just, you know, and it's all about just empowering women. You know, it, it, we, we, we all need to... to, to 
raise each other up and be, build each other up and there's the, and quit competing with each other, you know, and, and that's kind of the message that that in also, you know, and then it's just it's just it's life changing. There's I've, videos out there. I'll get teared up thinking about my the, the, the uh-huh. girls that I've that, that I've met in the program. So. Sounds, sounds like a wonderful organization, and um, I wish you all the best with that. And we will uh, uh, please feel free to stay in touch with me about anything you have going on with that, and I'll help you promote it. Um, uh, Robert, is there anything else you'd like to add before we uh, wrap up here? No, man. Just thanks, thanks <laughs> to you for having us on, man. You know, having us on the show. It's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool that people are interested in hearing about all of these things. You know, we've been yeah. It's kind of sometimes it's a little overwhelming for me, man. You know, people want to hear what I have to say. It's kind of, it's, you know, it's kind of cool. I dig it. Yeah. Well, the the record is is fantastic. Uh, Dirty Southern Soul. Uh, if my listeners out there, you guys can go to uh, stolenhearts dot rocks. And I didn't know yes. there was a dot rocks. That's cool. i got to get yeah, a dot right. rocks. Yeah, Pam found it. She yeah. found it. Well, I had first got StolenHeartsClub.com, which is also an access point, but then people started calling our band Stolen Hearts Club, and I was like, oh, and I went to StolenHearts.com, and some guy owns it, and he wants like $1,000 for it. And I was like, well, uh, no. And then uh, GoDaddy. <laughs> GoDaddy came up with the dot rocks as an extension for bands, and I, and I jumped right on it. And, well, uh, and it, it, it's really cool too because we like rocks. <laughs> absolutely does. So go, guys, go to StolenHearts uh, dot rocks, uh, and then from there you can navigate and get on their Facebook and Twitter and all that good stuff. And then you guys do have a YouTube channel as well. So if you guys go to uh, um, and here's how I found it. I went to Stolen Hearts Band. I typed that into YouTube search and I found you guys that way. Um, there's some good videos. And you guys sound excellent live, and Thank you can you. get get a taste of what the uh, the Stolen Hearts Live experience is all about. But make sure you guys get a copy of this uh, Dirty Southern Soul. It is an absolutely beautiful record of uh, just, uh, it, when you say, uh, you know, it's eclectic with a lot of different sounds, people can kind of get the mis- uh, interpretation that, that it's uh, like a mishmash, and it's not really. It's There's a very beautiful thread that flows through the whole thing. Nothing feels tacked on or paced together. I wouldn't have believed that this was a bunch of, uh, or, or a lot of, you know, separate stuff that just came together. It really has a cohesiveness and I really enjoyed listening to it and we will be uh, featuring it on our music podcast as well. Oh, that's oh, awesome. Good. And Thank tell everybody you. they can get signed copies straight from our website. They are also available on download for iTunes, CD Baby, but if they want a personalized signed copy from me and Robert with a little extra goodie, they can get it straight from our website, and we, we do it ourselves, mail it straight to them. There's a link on there. Um, so that's really cool. A lot of people have been, come, you know, and it, when you buy straight from the artist, all the money goes to the artist. You know, we want to make it available to everybody, um, but you can order it right straight through PayPal, and I send it out myself, so we appreciate. Um, and there's also uh, links to the YouTube channel from our website where you can sign up and subscribe right straight from there. All of our... Uh, Instagram, Twitter, everything's right there on our website. And we, Robert and I just both got nominated for our Queen City uh, Rock Artist of the Year, and we would appreciate your vote, too. You can go to Queen City Awards, um, and there's links to that on our website as well. So we want to thank everybody who, you know, stops by our website, stops by and likes our fan pages. That, you know, just creating buzz around your favorite bands is what helps local bands become national bands. You know, share it. My my motto is be the light, give the love, share the music. You know, be that. You know, if you, if you find a, and that don't have to be us. If any any fans out there have a, a local band that they just love, share it. Buy their merchandise. Go to their shows. Share their website. You know, send their music. Call in the radio station. Do it takes what it takes. It takes everybody to get to get stuff like that happening for for us musicians. And I, you know. I just want to. I just want to thank everybody, especially all the DJs, all the people who are interested in writing reviews on our CDs, all the radio stations that are playing. It's just very overwhelming, and and we feel so blessed. Well, there you have it, folks. Robert, Pam, thank you guys so much. You guys have a wonderful uh, rest of the day, wonderful Sunday, and uh, we will uh, continue to support you, and we will uh, be in touch because I talk to Frank all the time. <laughs> Yay! Thanks so much, Lou. We had a great time with you today. Yes, all right, you guys take you guys take care. All right. All right, all right you Thank too. You. All right, bye bye. Bye, y'all.